All right, all right, everyone. Thank you to those of you that are joining us and those who are going to be watching this next week um, and the weeks after. You are in for such a treat. Um, my name is Miguel Bustas, and I want to welcome you once again to Glide's monthly virtual series. Um, it's really about celebrating the Filipino culture this, this month. So our theme is Filipino American History Month. Soma Filipina, Filipina Cultural Heritage District. And we're gonna be talking to some leaders in the community, learning about the wonderful culture, why the district was created, and why it's important for us, all of us, to celebrate the community and to be a part of this cultural heritage district, as well as the history month that we are celebrating this month. So with that in mind, we're going to start first with the land acknowledgement, and I'd like to ask Eric Arguello to please lead us in that. We acknowledge that we are on the unseceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatouche Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land, and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatouche alone have never seceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Aho, thank you, Eric. Um, like we do every month, we start with a video that uh, we're going to play for you right now. So, Hannah, if you can uh, play the video. Soma is a place made possible because of our community's struggle and resilience to make a home here. And through the leadership of women, community workers, artists, youth, seniors, and immigrant families. It embraces the spirit of Bayanihan and our collective determination to honor our history, build community, and move forward. The community is the heart of Soma Pilipinas, and it's Soma Pilipinas' mission to serve the community. You be the one. Awesome. Awesome. So my Filipinas. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And tonight we have a special group of women leaders, women who have fought hard for the community, fought hard for cultural preservation, and fought hard for this cultural district. So I'm going to start off by just introducing you to these wonderful women. Gentel Labrinto is an organizer, research, and writer. Gentel is a Filipina community organizer, research, and writer, born and raised, and currently residing here in San Francisco. Yay, to all the natives. Uh, she's deeply committed to building power with communities to cultivate self-determination and to challenge inequity, inequitable systems that perpetuate disinvestment, displacement, and cultural erasure. She currently works as a community writer, a community organizer, and staff writer, where she helps lead race and equity in all planning coalition, a coalition of nearly 40 grassroots organizations throughout San Francisco, fighting for racial and social equity in city planning. Thank you for doing that. But prior to her role, Gentel served as a consultant in Somos Filipinas, leading the extensive community engagement, research, and development of a strategic report in partnership with the city to outline the strategies for this place, place, place-based cultural and community stabilization project. Next, we have Angelica Cabande. Uh, She's an organizer, born in the Philippines and immigrated to the United States at the age of eight. Angelica has been an organizer for over 22 years, combining art and organizing. She has supported the development of the San Francisco immigrants' residents by immigrants' residents by becoming engaged on issues of social justice, equity, community planning, and has educated, organized, and mobilized residents in local and national issues. She started with SOCAM in 2004 and has been the director since 2010. Thank you. Arena Alejo is an artist and cultural worker. Her 
timekeeping work, wait, her timekeeping work through their lenses as a San Francisco third generation renter, sustains a long-term collaborative relationship with micro communities, including families, tenants, and service workers to center and respond to care and community action, as well as cultural preservation. A History of Renting is her first book. Generous supports from Alejo's work include um, Center for Cultural Innovation, San Francisco's Arts Commission, Southern Exposure, API Cultural Center, This Will Take Time, Filipino American International Book Festival, and Bele Creative, where Alejo was once was its inaugural grantee. Their work is acquired, was acquired by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And Arena lives in uh, with the family in Excelsior District. So thank you all for, for joining us. As you all can see, we have an esteemed group of women that are, we're gonna be talking about some pretty incredible things around the community. So first of all, I would love to start. I would love to start with this question and anybody can answer. When was the first time that you realized that the rest of the world truly needed to understand and appreciate the culture of your people? And why it was important to share that with the rest of the world? Who would like to start first? Angelica? Hi everyone, Magandanga people, uh, good evening. Uh, to me, I mean, you know, I migrated here and and at first when I migrated here, there wasn't a lot of Filipinos around me except my family. And I've noticed that, um, you know, I really long for the, the community and I felt that our, our language is really important to have and preserve. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of uh, Filipinos who migrate here, they, at that time, cause you know, I'm, I'm 40 something now. So at the time when I was younger, folks um, really this um, parents wasn't encouraging their, their children to actually speak Filipino. And that was one of the things that I wanted to make sure as I got involved in the community, but also for myself to actually sustain our language and not be actually um, um, shy about it and, and speak it uh, loudly and uh, uh, freely. And that was one of the things that I actually was wanted to share with the world of the different dialects that we have and that were beyond the, the food of lumpia and, and pancet, right? That our culture is more than food. It's actually a vibrant uh, culture from the Philippines, but also there's uh, folks that are that grew up here, Filipino Americans have their own uh, had established and integrated American culture here too, and those are uh, things. All of this mixed culture um, is something we're really proud of, and at least for me, I'm very proud of to see. Yeah, I'll pass I it did. to you now. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Joe. So ate is means big sister in Tagalog, Filipino. And ate gel has been, you know, a, a mentor for me and so many, my brother and so many young people growing up in what is now Soma, Pilipinas. Uh, I was born, even though I was born here in San Francisco and I grew up in the Mission District, I, I went to, I started going to school in the South of Market. And so I think I, uh, I, was, I was really privileged to attend what is now uh, Bessie Carmichael Filipino Education Center. But in the 90s, it was a separate, the campus I was at, uh, the Filipino Education Center was its own K-5 school. And so I, I found a lot of empowerment in having Filipino teachers. And, and so I... I think even though I, I, I attended schools after elementary school that I didn't have, you know, direct role models who are Filipino, I wanted to, I sought to find those connections uh, after, in middle school, I attended Horace Mann Middle School in the Mission District. And so I, I just brought, I felt proud to bring my Filipino culture of giving. Uh, we share our love through food. 
And so I was giving, you know, like food from home, things my mom or my grandma would make, or uh, just the welcoming spirit that we have, uh, the idea of togetherness, but also the idea of like resilience. Uh, so in the 90s, our Filipino education center was at risk of being shut down. So uh, I learned a lot from the community organizing that SOMCAN uh, starting 2000s had put together to really make sure that the Filipino community stayed. So as uh, you know, while now we live in the Excelsior District and the Excelsior District is working to also you know, build a robust Filipino community here, there's a lot to learn from the blueprints that we have in Soma Pilipinas. Now pass it to Gentel, my high school classmate. <laughs> Thank you, Ate Jell and Irina. Um, similar to what Irina said, um, Angelica has also been a mentor for me entering into the community organizing space in the South of Market a couple of years ago. And um, I really appreciate this conversation. And Miguel, that was such a wonderful question. Um, I think what I'll have to share is, you know, my my family immigrated here um, in the 80s through the south of Market. My dad lived um, in the alleyways uh, and then lived at the Mint Mall, which for folks who are familiar with the south of Market is a real kind of cultural anchor for our community. Um, and growing up, I lived in Bernal Heights, uh, and, but my family was in the south of Market. I still have family there. Um, so I was able to be there constantly growing up as a child. And um, having a lot of my own personal family here, I've, I've always been connected and, and exposed to Filipino culture. And when you have that exposure growing up to your culture and you feel like you belong and you feel like you're around people who welcome you and accept you, that's something you love and want to protect. Um, and as I grew up and continued to learn about the history of Filipinos in this country, in San Francisco specifically, you quickly learn um, the contributions we've had to the city, um, a lot of which you know, has been obscured by history, by textbooks. Um, and, and that makes you want to lift that history up and speak about the legacies and have real pride. And also a lot of honestly pain hearing about some of the, the things our ancestors and, and folks who've come before us have had to endure in this country and even in the city and even up to this day. Um, so, you know, um, that's to say, you know, your own personal connection to culture is super important. And when you zoom out and think about the ways in which you're connected to a larger community, to the diaspora, it makes you want to, to be part of preserving it and, and, um, and protecting it. So that, that's my answer for that question. You know, um, I really appreciate that because um, especially the whole idea of the fact that it's, it's more than food. Um, what Angelica was saying, it, it, it is about resilience. Um, and that's why I love when, when people really go into preserving language. Because with language, you carry the history and you carry um, the, the, the nuance, the, the understanding, um, and so it, it's it's important, and I so I, I really love that. And I think if we look at the history of San Francisco and what happened in the South of Market uh, and the genocide that happened there, uh, just the way it happened with the Japantown in, in the Western Edition and with the Black community in the Fillmore, um, there was a lot to try to make right so that we didn't lose the history. And so that's why I'm so happy. Um, I, was, I was on the, the, the old, um, what's the commission in the city? And when we're looking at Bindle Stiff and when all that stuff was growing, uh, we were like, yeah, we have to vote to support programs like this so that culture can be alive and well. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that. But for, for people who are, are just joining in and who, don't have a sense of what um, the Heritage District is about. Um, you know, it, we started doing that here in, San, in the Mission District, and it was very intentional because we needed to put a line in the sand because we were getting a lot of people moving into the community, which is all right, 
but they wanted us to begin to stop doing our cultural events. And they would tell us that. And so we thought, okay, you know what? One, we got to put a line in the sand to say, this is a community that's cultural. So one, you got to know you're coming into that. But also, it, it brought all the cultural institutions together in a block. So for, for the three of you, can you share with us what is the Soma Filipinas Heritage District in, in, your, in your point of view? Well, I could share with you uh, from the SOMCAN's point of view because of the, the community, collective community work that went into getting this. And thank you for sharing about the, the, the line on the <laughs> sand because uh, that's basically what, you know, the Soma Filipinas Filipino Cultural Heritage District, the, the concept and idea was actually proposed in the early 2000 as part of the West Soma uh, plan. Um, unfortunately, it just sat in uh, the planning department's desk and wasn't really uh, brought up by, by planning department and made into a reality, right? But then from all of the displacement and gentrification that our community has been enduring, since the I Hotel and even before that, we really came to a point of like, this is enough, right? And we need to start using planning in the perspective of community and really having this community planning push forward. And with the, you know, um, we were actually inspired by, by Kaya Benticuatro and the Japantown and how some of the, be the lessons learned and, and the best thinkings of uh, putting that together right and we wanted to have something like that here in the south of market because we've been here in the soma for a hundred years you know the grand oriente was actually purchased by our filipino manons manons is uh elder and they actually had to purchase this building because you know they could you imagine in the 50s and 60s they were all they were facing discrimination, just like the Chinese, Japanese, black communities, right? And um, they were getting, they weren't getting support in terms of uh, social needs as well as they were, they were getting denied to actually rent, rent units. And what all of these manos did is they, they created a Maso um, Masonic Lodge um, and put all their money together to actually purchase this building, which is now Grand Oriente. And they had to do that be, um, uh, somewhat underground because, you know, at that time, uh, Asians couldn't actually own, uh, own property. So they had to go through this Masonic or this brotherhood way in order to actually purchase that. And, and you know, for us, we were tired of seeing our community uh, voice get tokenized, uh, always put on the side, yeah, we will be in meetings, but at the same time, we're not seeing the ideas, we're not seeing the solutions that we actually want uh, the city to, to take. And, when the 5M development came around, we're like, you know what? We really got to put something forward. And we, you know, we took up uh, SOMCAN and FADF, gathered our community together to push forward the Soma Filipinas. And it really, you know, um, and got the ordinance passed in 2016 and really paid way in making sure that it's not just an ordinance that talks about our culture or, or our our history in SOMA, but also pushing forward, what can we do? What are the solutions that we that the city can partner with our community to not only uh, preserve our community here in the SOMA, but also help build and grow it and uh, build our visibility here in the South of Market. Yeah, um, and I have a, a follow-up after that, but I would love, um... Uh, anyone else who would like to answer that question? What is some of Filipinos heritage district? I, for me, as someone who uh, went to school and, and grew up in South of Market, I mean, I, I think I just really look to folks like Atejel, who are one of the people who wrote the constitution for what is now Soma Pilipinas. I think that 
advocacy advocacy really comes from the community members and the the solidarity effort from allies as well and a lot of that also comes through for me as an artist through the arts so for instance a big example of making sure that we do have Filipino families remaining in the south of market at least going through school uh, was the you know making sure that the Filipino education center wasn't closed a big part of that was uh, through poetry spoken word a dance song a lot of the teachers mobilized students like me and families and parents to spread the word about what's happening at the school and and I think also it's a Soma Pilipinas is about the arts and action. So we think a lot about how culture change is at the front of political change. And so we wanted to make sure that our Filipino culture and supporters were at the forefront. Uh, and then, you know, later on, we can really think about uh, how to implement that into policy, because sometimes that that eventually only comes later. We do run up against a lot of um, uh, entities like the San Francisco Planning Commission that you know does have different processes. Um, but I, I think this is this is across the board for other cultural districts that also arose you know around the time that the um, California Arts Council um, implement and made, made sure that there's funding for cultural districts. <clears throat> So back to the example of mobilizing, one example was that um, there's a there's a park near Bessie Carmichael and Philippine Education Center called the Jean Friend Recreation Center. And one way that the families and educators and organizers mobilized the students was, um, you know, we didn't have a physical education space uh, at, at uh, when I think at the jail, it was when we had already moved to Bessie, right? So we had this Filipino Education Center had already consolidated its students to Bessie Carmichael, Filipino Bessie Carmichael, and at that time it was in the small and it was in the lot what is now Victoria Manalo Draves Park, but we were in bungalows and there wasn't much space to make sure that there's physical education for all the students. So what the really smart thing that the the teachers and the families did was we made sure that there was still you know the students were still taking up space and utilizing community centers so they we walked every day to Jean Friend Recreation Park um, pro, I think that's probably about two to three blocks away it might be like a seven to ten minute 15 minute walk depending on how many students but we would we the teachers made sure that we were visible in the community and we were taking up space at gene friend is also the space where um we recited this poem by one of the also the co-founders of soma filipinas mc canlas um who he wrote you know soma ang soma ba which was really about fighting gentrification and the loss of, of spaces for Filipino communities. So it's really back to, uh, just to summarize my point, it's really about visibility and taking action through artistic expression, which continues to be a big way that we want to make sure that Soma Filipinas and Filipino communities are seen, even though there might not be designated, you know, spaces and housing for Filipino communities. We think about how, you know, there's Filipino and other working class families living or were living in 33 Tahama, right? And now that place is flooded. So we want to be able to see where all where are all our, our communities housed at and how are we also building community connections across cultures. Wow. Thank you. Intel? Yeah, I think Ate Jal and Arena said said it so eloquently, but I really just want to piggyback off of Arena's comment about taking up space. Um, you know, Soma Filipinas was founded in 2016, as folks mentioned here, and even though we've had a history of over 100 years here, um, for many folks who might not be familiar with San Francisco or who during the tech wave, this recent tech wave we're still in, see the South of Market as kind of the tech hub, right? They see it as high rises, they see it as businesses and hotels, 
um, they often forget or not even forget, aren't aware that there are families, that it's a rich network of multi-generational residents, artists, workers, um, cultural bearers, uh, community serving organizations. So this act of taking up space physically and having that actually put into legislation, into writing that this is where this community exists, it is powerful, right? Of course, there are things we have to do to make sure, as Ati Jell says, it's more than just something living on a paper, that it actually has action and teeth behind it. Um, I want to lift up uh, what who, who Arena mentioned, um, Tito MC Canlas, who in a conversation with me said, you know, without this designation, some of Filipinas exist in the mind. And for me, that was really powerful. He was like, it, it exists in our mind unless we make it clear that it exists in real life, that it's really here, that we are visible. Um, so that that's what Soma Filipinas means to, to a lot of us. It's a taking of space of a place that has been ours, that we have been in, um, but having it formally recognized is is powerful in some way. You, you know, um, the, the former redevelopment agency that uh, back in the, the four, well, the, what, the 60s, 70s and, and 80s, um, did a, a number on many communities here and um, started with Justin Herman in the Fillmore and then they kept going with um, literally ridding um, Soma from or the, commu the Filipino community from Soma when there was so much history there and, and we saw a lot of that. Um, there was legislation, it's called Certificate of Preference that uh, anyone who was displaced from a former redevelopment agency um, would have a, a certificate to be able to come back. Now, the trick was they were, they were doing it so that, you know, it, so much time would pass that people forgot. Um, so when I was appointed uh, to the redevelopment agency um, in 2009, we resurrected that. And we moved and approved it so that those that were once there that had a certificate of preference, that their children and their grandchildren, and then most recently, it's now statewide, descendants after that have access to come back. Um, so keep that in mind, because that's really important to try to bring people back. And it wasn't, it was when Marilyn and Breed was supervisor because uh, she and I sat on the Redevelopment Commission together, I told her we needed to create something similar, which then created the neighborhood preference uh, legislation so that people who help build the community have an opportunity to stay in the community. Um, so I just throw that as a resource uh, to let people know because uh, people deserve to be able to have those, those opportunities to come back home. And... Um, so with all the new development that's happening, um, some folks, this is their home, right? This is the roots. So anyway, enough on that. Um, but just wanted to throw that out just so that folks know that that's a really take advantage of it. Um, so can you paint a picture for us? Um, what, what, from what you've heard, because I think most of us weren't young enough because we weren't around back then. What was it like to have a rich, vibrant Filipino community in Soma? And what were some of the things you heard um, that, that, that you could share with us? Just to give us some insight on, on what we're missing now, but what we can work towards to recreating, uh, whether it's there or in other places, um, what did you all hear? Let's see, Shan, did you tell? That's a great question. Um, and I'd love to hear from my fellow panelists to jump in, but I want to say that vibrancy and, you know, cultural network is, is still alive. Um, you know, it is still here. There are many ways in which our cultural bearers are still holding, holding that up. What I would like to discuss and bring up a bit is um, Manila Town, um, which was, you know, a really vibrant, bustling Filipino community on Kearney Street, right next to Chinatown. 
that unfortunately, you know, with the fall of the International Hotel and the very violent evictions that took place in 1977, really marked the end of that neighborhood as, as we knew it. And from the research we've done from some of the folks who may, may not be alive or around right now who were there during that time, um, spoke of how it was a place for people to gather. They had, you know, um, barber shops and a lot of restaurants and gathering places uh, for people to just hang out, even as like some folks remember it as, as children sitting there while their their um, parents played pool. And, you know, it was a, it was a place for our community and, and was known well for that. But as we've seen a lot of inequitable development practices, urban renewal, the um, prioritization of profit over people and, and and their stabilization, you know, erase that place. Um, that was really a place where a lot of folks who, um, you know, immigrated here, a lot of the Manos that Angelica mentioned, um, really settled and were able to afford, um, you know, that that place no longer, no longer exists. So, you know, while the South of Market is a historical gateway for Filipinos and is regarded as the Filipino Cultural Heritage District. We can't speak about it unless we mention Manila Town and, and how that erasure in the 70s is a huge reason why claiming space in the South of Market is so important. Um, but yeah, Irina, do you have anything to add? Or I'm sure you have way more to add. Uh, I, I think all of us have different uh, points and memories of you know our experience in in the south of market uh, i think before i start i, I want to just also point back to um i know miguel quoted uh, or mentioned justin herman but this there's this one quote he said that you know i i think um for me i really think about and and uh, curators like and organizers like leanne ladia have made work about it that i think it inspires people to make sure to take up space so in 1970 justin herman said this land is too valuable to permit poor people to park on it. And so if we just, if we think about that quote and apply it to even what happened with the International Hotel uh, and think about what's happening even along Mission Street, which includes parts of South of Market and Soma Pilipinas, um, <clears throat> it's a it's erasure and, and has also contributed to this um, yeah, this this uh, this prejudice against uh, communities of color, um, and I guess about coming back to your question, I've only really experienced. I will only have memories of the '90s in the like late '90s um, as a young person. I'm sure at the jail can share so much more of you know young people in the tw in their twenties experiencing being Filipino, Filipino American in South of Market. I think. I, I'm I, I'm still experiencing that time, um, but when I was uh, when I was like seven, you know, seven to like twelve years old, um, we didn't have our only experience of a we have a lantern festival, a Filipino lantern festival that we call Parol Festival. Folks are interested. We actually have workshops happening in Soma Pilipinas for making your own lantern and attending workshops. And it culminates in a, a parade, a festival around uh, Yerba Buena Gardens, um, which you get to showcase your, your lantern and so many community organizations also participate in a competition to, you know, show off your star. But we did, we had a very small one at the basement of the Mint Mall. And, and so, um, you know, my mom was an organizer also at that time, then we would stay there until midnight um, making, making the lanterns and, you know, just, uh, archipelago books, uh, our, our Filipino bookstore was also in the basement. So the Mint Mall housed many and multiple Filipino businesses that now are, you know, uh, fortunately, and still, you know, struggling to take up space on the ground levels of many parts of South of Market. But I think it was, Mint Mall is a building where residents also live. There's um, the restaurant. There's also a butcher shop nearby or was um, so you can get your hair cut. So it's it's in a way a mini version of what was Manila Town. 
but also at the same time I would love to ask at the gel too bindle stiff was also like it was such a hub yeah even in like the 90s or even earlier for for young Filipino Americans and I'd love to hear more also SOMCAN also was such a all these community spaces that brought the artists and culture workers together and to gel <laughs> I mean, there is a lot of stories, but also my own experience. But I do want to lift up uh, Robles, uh, Bill Soro, and also uh, Phil Chavez, who was really the folks that opened their arm to me when I was uh, I was actually working around Soma, but I didn't know there was hella Filipinos here. I was a customer service on uh, I think Natoma Street and didn't realize there was a bookstore, there was all this organization and businesses in the um, just a few blocks from me. But then one day I, I learned about Archipelago Bookstore. And as I went to the, um, at that time it was at the um, Mint Mall. And, and, you know, that's where I met Al Robles and Phil. And basically, you know, um, if you guys don't know, Al is like, He's not just a, a really dope poet, but you know, he was actually part of the I Hotel fight. Um, and he, you know, he, him and a lot of um, elders really kept the fight to make sure that the I Hotel and Manila, time, Manila Town comes back home to that site and only a 100% affordable housing uh, was built on that site and he would tell me stories about you know when when folks got evicted at that that night and how they had to look for resources and one of the areas that they were looking into is the south of market so a lot of the manos had moved into soma um, but also there was a lot of challenges of resources at that time right for for our community so what they do is just like any community, they they pulled their resource together and they would cook for each other, you know, uh, have um, have music time together and just talk stories all night. And and I actually got to experience that when I started when I started getting involved in Soma. Um, we would go to the Mint Mall and would sing karaoke, or Phil would actually bring out his guitar or ukulele and we'll be there till like one in the morning singing Filipino songs and then we had to come we come back at nine o'clock in the morning to uh to organize and work with families and and all these folks so uh so I definitely saw Soma more than my own home and um but it was really great because you know Phil actually took me around um the south of market where I got to walk at Bindle Step and learn about the only block box theater for Filipino um, artists, right? And then got to learn about the Veterans Equity Center who provided uh, services to, to the vet, uh, Filipino veterans, to uh, FADF and, you know, to all these um, amazing groups. At, at the same time, they were, you know, Al Robles would talk to me, would tell me stories about how when, um, they would actually started barrio fiesta in the neighborhood and because you know there's they wanted people to feel like home so they would replicate uh barrio fiesta here and sometimes they would actually um illegally <laughs> as he would put it um cook a pig under the freeway off ramp so folks can actually have that uh lechon and they would bring the barrio fiesta the next day and for all of you guys lechon takes about 12 to 18 hours to like you gotta rotate it so there sometimes he's like they're there all night just you know preparing this lechon for for the community and then they also started pasco Soma in the uh in the mid mall just to take up space and show that filipinos are here and also that was the space that you know the first dot com that a lot of the nonprofits and small businesses was almost evicted out of out of the mint mall because because of the owner wanted to make space for the tech um 
tech uh, companies at that time. So, you know, now we're relieving some of that, but luckily we were, we've learned from the past and also learned from other communities um, on how we could actually use planning as a way for to bring forward and preserve and sustain our community. So through that, you know, that's the community, uh, a lot of the Soma Filipina stuff that's happening right now from Parol Lantern to uh, a lot of arts in the community and looking forward to more of that here. Wow. I could go on for a long time, sorry, because there's a lot of stories, but some aren't even my stories. It's uh, talk stories to me at one o'clock in the morning on a, a donut place. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we do this? Let's let's come to my house. I got a big backyard. Let's make some lechon and we'll just sit on the patio and talk stories because I love it. Um, oh, man, you, that would you know, be great. <laughs> I think those are the same way. It's about how do you tell those stories? Because in stories, there's truth. Yes. Right? And, you know, I, I, I hear a lot of um, reference to people. And I, and I, I know that at least, you know, in my community, elders are, are everything, right? You honor, you honor elders. Who are the elders that you want to just call that, that say their name and give us a sense who they were? Some may not be with us anymore on this, on this plane, right? Maybe they're with the ancestors now, right? They became an ancestor. But I, I would love to hear the names of the people who, who touched you and who helped you with strength and wisdom. Oh man, there's just so many, but definitely, you know, I just want to echo again, Al Robles, um, Phil Chavez, uh, Bill Soro, uh, Marie Romero, you know, she was the first owner of the Archipelago, Archipelago Bookstore. Um, and then also there's Stella Habal, who was also part of the fight of the I Hotel, but also the, the ethnic studies. Um, and yeah, uh, Bernadette uh, C and so many so more folks, but I'll pass it to the other, to the other women on the panel. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, and, and um, living, living in past ancestors, I mean, aside from the names um, of just these incredible elders that the gel mentioned, um, I don't think we have this partnership anymore at Bessie Carmichael Filipino Education Center, but we would have seniors from the local senior housing come and volunteer and, and mentor the students. So uh, there would, you know, a grandma, one of the grandmas is my own grandma, uh, Josefina, uh, a volunteer grandma named Grandma Lillian. We, uh, these are elders who lived uh, at either at the Alice Gardens housing or other spaces in the community. Um, I also think about the Manongs who have passed, who um, every August 4th, we would do a procession around the building of Manila Town International Hotel. And when the Manongs were alive, there would be... Um, they would sing and they would sing, you know, classics they want to sing, whatever it be the whole afternoon to the evening. And so I, I think a lot about uh, these ancestors uh, past. Um, I think a lot about uh, photographers also who documented the history of the I Hotel. Um, he's still living, but I've been meaning to visit him. His name is Crystal K. Huey. He photographed a lot of the the elders, the seniors living at the International Hotel at the height of the evictions. So just just folks like that. Um, and I mean, I think even everyone here are also living ancestors. Um, and I, I also think about growing up in the mission, a lot of folks who also taught me about community and in my buildings, because I, I think a lot about um, <clears throat> what publics are, my backyard was, you know, going outside my living room was going outside of our, you know, our, our very small apartment and being in community with, with others. Yeah, this is such a beautiful question. I want to 
Also, you know, I lift up the the names that at the jail brought up. A lot of the folks we look to as, you know, his, our our heroes and sheroes. Um, I think a lot of uh, the vet, the veteranos, a lot of the um, elders uh, who were manos who fought in World War II, many of whom were didn't receive recognition from the United States for their contributions and might have passed away before receiving those commendations. Um, many of whom lived in the South of Market up until their passing. Um, I think of it's it's emotional to think about. Um, I think of all of the um, family members I have who still live there. My elderly grandfather who passed away. Oh man, fifteen years ago, but was a someone who lived in Mint Mall and was a laborer in a hotel close by. Um, nearly all of my dad's family worked at the Marriott on 4th or still work there. Um, a lot of our community members work in hospitality industries. I think of my um, my grandmother's father, Serviliano Cerv Ramos, who um, was a mano who moved here in the 20s and who fought in the war and uh, who lived in Manila town, um, but was also displaced and had to move to the Soma. Um, there are just, yeah, so many folks who, in our fight to continue lifting up Soma Filipinas and our, our culture, um, you know, we, we miss and recognize that their contributions are a lot of the reasons, and stories are a lot of the reasons why we're, we're here. Um, and our families are here. So uh, yeah, really appreciate the question. Thank you for allowing us to bring forward some names. No, it's important. I, and I wanna lift up Alice Bulos. Um, she was uh, um, a mentor for me. Um, I knew her um, when I was living in Washington DC working for the president and Alice Bulos would show up and she fought. And I love that about her. Um, and then when I moved back home, um, we would go have lunch. And um, she was just such a, a such a, a uh, she was such a proud, um, gentle, but a warrior. Um, and I and I definitely want to lift up Le Cifuentes, our next door neighbor, who basically helped raise me as a kid, a child uh, right here on 24th and Harrison. Um, we, we, you know, it's always good to remember those people that walk before us, you know, because they give you strength, right? And shoot, if they were able to, to go through, then we gain strength from that to say, okay, well, we, we got to continue the work and and I would love to, to hear from, from each of you, what did you learn about your community as you all went through the process of creating this district? What were some of the highlights of things that you learned? Who would like uh, to start? Well, for me, I've learned, you know, there's a lot of history or like, uh things that i don't always know which is great to learn right and i've also learned that a lot of women was doing a lot of behind the scenes work and i really appreciate it and uh appreciate them and and hearing about the when we were working on the ordinance just all the you know names and all the work that and um, you know unrecognized work that a lot of people did for us to get to this point, right? And and just really appreciated that, but also realized there's still a lot of work to do and um, a lot of lessons to be learned from the past and that um, really appreciate that being able to really work with a lot of folks from the community and, and learning a lot of um, great stories and, uh, and the, just the strength of the community. And, I really appreciate that because, you know, as a migrant, when I came here, I didn't think there was, uh, I was going to be part of this uh, great community. And, I, you know, we, when we migrated here, we migrated in Daly City. I just happened to wanted to come to San Francisco when I was 18. So didn't really think that uh, there is a, a robust and uh, um a thriving community here but also you know in, in daily city there's a lot of 
culture and history that's happening there too. And I think um, a lot of us are learning lessons from different areas and it's really exciting to see that we're all lifting up and helping each other and uh, sharing the lessons that we're learning. And we're also getting more involved in a lot of the civic engagement, right? And I really appreciate that from, from learning that from a lot of the elders of, of needing to not just fight for things, but making sure that things continue to, uh, you know, especially with the city that they continue to, to do what they promised to do. And, you know, for us to be innovative and push the boundaries of our advocacy work. Sometimes not everybody's gonna appreciate or like the, the organizing that we do, but, um, you know, uh, in the end of the day, it's for our community. Arena, Danielle. I can jump in a bit. Um, so I wasn't around when um, the cultural district resolution was being drafted and put together. Um, so I can speak a bit about my time working with the cultural district and as a community member with family members here um, and as a scholar who has researched the history of the district. Um, as Atijel said, there is so much history here, um, but there's also so much love and commitment to this district, to the community. Um, people don't wanna just preserve it and freeze it in time. They wanna set it up to thrive and grow. And there are a lot of people um, who wanna see and know the solutions truly. Like we need to look at community expertise when we think about planning our city. Like the people who live in a community know the solutions they need, they know what, would help them stay in place, what would help grow their families, what would continue to build this district and community for generations to come. Um, so I wanna say something I learned is, yes, this community is resilient, but they've had to be because they haven't had that investment. They haven't had that support. So I think if um, the city truly values the cultural fabric of our communities, has put so much work into establishing these cultural districts. There are 10 now, I believe, all across the city. Um, we need to be more than, we need to be seen as more than a resilient community that can take care of ourselves. We need to be supported and invested in. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, us being established as a cultural district and having that, you know, actual, you know, designation can move from, from just that recognition to actually being um, a community invested in and, and really supported so we can we can continue to thrive. Great, thank you. I, I think a big part of what Atijel and Jintel has said is really investing in nurturing our community members as people who are part of the community and, are, and have agency. Uh, I think I think a lot about how, um, you know, part of Soma Pilipinas was established in 2016, but the work has been going on before. And one of those organizations has been SOMPCAN. They have programs that support uh, in, in people in the community who um, are fighting evictions, uh, who are working through housing and just knowing their housing rights. Another component that SOMPCAN has is their youth mentorship program. They have uh, Johanna Youth Organizing uh, our homes and Johanna. <laughs> I, I have to remember the whole. If, can someone help me with Johanna? Uh, youth organizing home and neighborhood action. <laughs> yes. So we have a lot of students from Bessie Carmichael Filipino Education Center. You know, as early as middle school, be interested in joining Johanna as high schoolers. Uh, so I think that that pipeline, that youth organizing pipeline is being nurtured by grassroots organizations and the importance of neighborhood organizing. Um, I, uh, I, I've, you know, I was a young, I was very young and uh, I wasn't, I was away for college when the constant, when, you know, the Soma Pilipinas was being drafted, but I think there, there are, I, one thing I've really just been, uh, really proud to see is say you know you have an immigrant family who just came to the U.S. a couple months ago right and then they're they um, <clears throat> they ask for help or they receive resources and 
it's you know it's kind of like they receive you know, church you know like if they're religious they receive like church um resources but also they receive community resources like putting in after school programs like Galimbata or West Bay or United Players and and so it helps them also um how do I put this in English like namumulat like they're just um they're just growing consciousness of um and it, you know it, part of it is like being politicized like it's it is a political thing to live and exist and go to school in South Market because there's still so much to fight for. So I think I just feel proud for our families who are, uh, you know, take, learning that they have that power and agency um, to speak up. We have families, you know, who are going to City Hall supporting, you know, different uh, actions that we want to have for our communities. Um, these are things that people do outside of their their you know just their family life but it's become integrated so I think that's also why uh, Gentel at the gel and I are here as panelists because we have family members and community organized community members who helped us who called us in to be part of that action um, I mean sometimes I wish there was a point that there's you know peace and that we're able to really live in comfort but I think right now there's still so much to fight for yeah. and to leverage that uh, I I think this is our way of thriving also is just to be really vigilant, uh, especially as a big part is just like land land use and ownership in South of Market is a big thing um, that I, I wish that <clears throat> we continue to fight for, for local businesses and uh, res low, working class residents. Yeah, no, absolutely. Wow, that's that. Yes, thank you for, thank you all for that. Um, you know, we have a, a question, um, and before we get to the question, there's one person I also want to lift up, um, and I noticed that Josephine uh, Sobarbaro is on, um, and I want to lift up her mother, Carmen. Dr. Carmen Sobarbaro was uh, a dentist, um, and she raised a, a wonderful family, and um, when I went to high school at Archbishop Rudin, I was uh, honored to get the James Sabarro Award, named after um, Carmen's son who was killed. Um, and so I just want to lift it up uh, Dr. Carmen Sabarro and the and the family who. Um, so Josephine, thank you for for being and joining here with us. Whew, I tell you, wow. Um, so we have a question. Is I would be interested to learn about Kapwa Gardens and how it may promote Filipino culture in Soma and bring in newcomers to understand and better appreciate the community. Um, any other venues or resources? Who would like to answer that? Don't jump in all at once. Irina. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I can I can start and then I, I'm interested how also both of you will chime in. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think for me, uh, uh, Kapwa Garden is is uh, currently just a, a temporary space because it will be become uh, it will be built into housing right at the jail and Gentel. But I think what we've really done, uh, Cultivate Labs uh, and Balai Creative, have really done is to be creative with the space and, and open up, create this into a green green space, uh, green and publicly accessible open spaces in South of Market are highly contested and highly privatized, and say the only, for example, the only you designated youth and family green space in the district is Victoria Manalo Draves Park. If if I, I think that's yeah that's designated uh, as an ordinance. But I mean, just come to think of that. So uh, having a space like Kapwa Gardens that is open to community and has Filipino, Filipino American cultural programming has been really important to uh, also tapping into generations and demographics that might not necessarily know that this community exists in South of Market. Uh, a big part of what I appreciate about Cultivate Labs and their their development of what is Kapwa Garden uh, is the ability to use technology as a way to connect 
different communities. We have uh, folks like Desi, Desi Daganan, uh, Gina Marco Rosales, and other folks who have, in a way, left tech to really uplift their, you know, their own Filipino identity and culture and community, and putting back these resources and tools they have to uplifting our district. So that's what I really appreciate about Capua Garden, and I wish that we will continue to create these green spaces in the city, especially in South of Market, even when, um, and gratefully that affordable housing, I think for seniors will be built mm -hmm. upon where Capua Garden is now. If, can someone fact check me on that? <laughs> is that correct? It will be housing of some sort. Yeah. And yeah. I think it is under the, um, is, I'm just trying to determine if it's a 5M development, but I think that's a way that we're also creative, creating connections and in a way like interventions with um, just also, um, <clears throat> yeah, just interventions and resistance. Anybody else wanna? Yeah, I'll, yeah thanks so much, Irina. I'll jump in a little bit. Um, yeah, Couple Gardens, Jane, this is such a great question, um, has been such a, a great community space for the time that it's been open. I know that prior to this, a lot of programming and events were at um, the Bayanihan Community Center, um, which is at Sixth and Mission, and there's only so much space in there for um, elders to use it and youth to use it, and then, you know, people are hosting, like, film events in there, um, so it's nice to kind of have an extra space to meet. Um, and one thing that's really great about Couple Gardens is it's used, uh, it has elements of, you know, Filipino art and it is used a lot for Filipino American programming. But I know that um, a lot of nonprofits and other um, organizations use the space. And it's a way I think to really get educated on where you're at, you know, you're in the heart of Soma Filipinas, you're in the Soma Filipinas Filipino Cultural District in a space that has been fought for and advocated for by, by Filipino community. And that's a way in which we can intervene and hopefully raise um, some awareness for folks to better appreciate the community. Um, and yeah, I mean, so much has taken place there. I, I know that um, elders in response to anti-Asian violence have been trained in self-defense there. Um, there have been film, um, you know, film, film screenings there. Um, there's the Undiscovered Night Market, I believe, will be there, which happens this weekend um, that uh, I know Cult Cultivate Labs has been, um, yeah, Desi Danganan has been leading. Um, so yeah, a lot of cultural activation, a lot of taking up of space has been really great and to see it culminate in an actual physical space that we can use has been really powerful. Uh, Atijal, anything to add? Yes, thank you. I think definitely, you know, um, like Chantel was saying, um, there's just a lot of activities that, you know, and space needs that our community uh, really needs. For example, um, we have the San Francisco Filipino Cultural Center that actually just hosted uh, a book, um, book readings and, and it's utilized by a lot of our community. They're also going to have um, showcase some of the uh, Esprima and Kale um, martial arts um, weapons in the Philippines. Um, that's gonna be coming up soon. Um, of course, there's always the Bayanian Community Center that that's um, definitely still a marker for a lot of us. If you go there, you'll actually see a mural of the different heroes and heroes that are youth and community members had um, painted of um, Al Robles, um, uh, Bullet Marasigan, Carlos Villa, whose um, artwork is actually at the Asian Art Museum right now. And, and of course, there's now Capua Gardens, um, but we still need more because aside from uh, event spaces, we also need space to have to have for our services um, and 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 um, and dance. So I I know Cool Arts is trying to figure out how to create a, a dance um, space for our community. Um, there's also always Bindlestick Studio, who who's been amazing space for folks to start 
learning and seeing artists that actually are either doing um, a theater that's in Filipino or just Filipino American from um, queer to uh, to young folks and everybody in between. I know they're actually doing um, mass making teaching this this weekend. So there is we need a lot of space, and I think Kapwa Garden is a great contribution to that and all of the different activities that our community would like to see. And you know, for folks that are that are also visiting here. Um, but at the same time, we're still uh, challenged with a lot of hyper development that's engulfing and overshadowing our community. And that's why it's great that Soma Filipinas is actually gonna have a, an arc, <laughs> a welcome arc finally uh, on, on Folsom and Rust uh, that's coming up in a, in a year or two. So as uh, so we're, we're we're organizing and doing all of this uh, cultural stuff. We're also continuing to fight for visibility and ensuring all these things we're doing becomes permanent and yeah. for the next generation. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because Eric Arguello, who's on our team, and I keep um, talking about the the arc or the gateway that we're looking for, Kaye. And we're, I'm like, Eric, you got to learn some lessons from these women. They're they're going to be able to do it in a year. And how long have we been talking about this? But that's that's for another conversation. So we didn't learn. Um, but no, that that's wonderful. You know, we're we're almost at, at at time. But you know, I just there's two questions I I want to ask. Um, one is, what is your vision? Give us give us your vision of the future for the community. In, in San Francisco in the Bay Area? Oh man, that's a big question. Let me let me pass it to other people first, Chantel. <laughs> I know I'm like, oh man, we could go on forever. That could be a two hour panel right there. Um, I'll just think of some things at the top of my head. Um, stabilization of residents and cultural assets and cultural anchors, um, you know, as part of that vision. I know many organizations, as Atijal said, land and, and spaces are really hard to get. Um, and we know that rents are expensive, buildings are expensive. Um, many organizations have purchased or are purchasing their own buildings to continue to stay and serve the community. I think of you know, United Players and West Bay, who I believe West Bay just bought a building, which is amazing. They've been around since the 70s. They are a cultural, you know, uh, landmark in, in the South of Market. Um, I think y'all mentioned, you know, Performing Arts Center. Um, so, you know, thing, things like that, because we do have a lot, uh, I don't wanna say a lot, but we do have some forms of visibility and temporary art here in the district. You know, we have the utility boxes that some can really um, fought for and organize, they're beautiful. Um, banners up on the streets, murals, but uh, we want more than just temporary projects. You know, we want permanent cultural markers. The gateway is gonna be a really huge part of that. And then also, you know, a lot of monuments that point to Filipino history, like the Dewey Monument uh, in Union Square, you know, they serve as like symbols of painful colonial history of conquest and our community deserves to see public displays that actually celebrate and acknowledge our contribution. So, you know, that's part of the vision as well. Um, and, you know, I'd like to see more capacity building for um, community based organizations, uh, arts and cultural, the arts and cultural sectors. Um, more support and investment and in strategies like small sites acquisitions and tenant stabilization. Um, and I know Atijel can speak more to the vision she puts out a lot, but like holistic communities that really, um, really speak to and support children, youth, families, all of the elders we have in this neighborhood. Um, and I want to I want to leave that for her because I think Angelica always speaks so powerfully about the need for holistic communities, but that, that's part of the vision. There's so much we could do um, with, a, with a lot of support and investment. Great, and, and it, as the rest of you, if that goes to the next question is, how can we be supportive of, of, of this vision that you have? So, 
feel free to add that to it as well. Go for it, Arena. I'm still trying to like. <laughs> and I and I think uh, this is tough, but I mean, I this is kind of a contested thing. But if they would just stop building housing where they always build housing and and just build housing in, in other historical places where people people are wealthy and, and try to lobby away from <laughs> building homes, you know, in other neighborhoods in San Francisco where people are wealthy and then they- West side. <laughs> West side. West Did side, oh my goodness, so many places. You know, I think I have, uh, you know, uh, we have, we have um, people in, in leadership who, um, who just let these things pass there's a lot of multi multi-decade planning of development along mission street uh and mission street uh, you know threading the mission of uh, excelsior and south of market which i focus on on my art practice there's it's like a hotbed for developments and what kind of developments these are luxury or market rate housing why can't it why can't there be um, leg legislation put in, you know, building ho homes like these uh, in Russian Hill, you know, other places in the city. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of redlining that's still taking place. It's just <clears throat> in different terms. Uh, and I think it still continues to push out families, working class families, families who've lived here for, you know, eight generations deep. We want to make sure that the history remains. Um, so yes, definitely um, affordable housing, please. Yeah, and, and housing in other places in the city. Thank you, Joe. I mean, I think for me, you know, as just like Cayo Bente Cuatro, I think Soma Filipinas is one of the uh, other cultural district that has the cultural heritage housing and economic sustainability strategy. Uh, in short chess report that's already out there and has all the strategies that folks are thinking about from preserving and growing uh, housing, affordable housing in our area, keeping our existing residents, but also bringing in uh, new residents, right? Uh, back into the community, as well as addressing pedestrian safety, language access, as well as, um, uh, um, having more space, right? So the chess report is not just, um, if anything, it's not just a report that, you know, we, it took us over years to actually pull this together and it just passed the board of supervisors. But like I said, you know, anything that passed or any write up from the city, it doesn't, it's, it just sits there without us continuing to work with them and reminding them that you know this needs to happen it's not we didn't put all this time and energy on it just so it sits on someone's desk so definitely that's one way we and we're already all working on that and i hope to see a lot of that strategies from you know more money for small sites uh purchasing buildings to more support to tenants being able to stay uh especially you know a lot of folks lost their work and now we're in this whole new inflation that's happening and it's affecting people's work. So, so you know, there's a, gonna be another wave of uh, economic challenges for everyone. So um, I hope that's how folks can help us. But on a fun note, I hope that uh, folks can, um, you know, as Chantel uh, shared this earlier, we actually had a utility box of uh, abacada, which is Filipino alphabet. So if you go to SOMCAN site, you will see the utility box map and you could go around learning Filipino uh, words as well as um, a photo or a, a sketch of that that actually um, tells you what that word is. So that's one of the ways we're lifting up our language and exposing it and sharing it with the general public of understanding what lang what is our language and how to say certain things. Uh, but for me also, I want to see that there's ongoing connections of us learning about our past and our work, right? There's still a lot of Filipino farmers um, in Stockton, the, the stories and histories of Stockton. And, um, and you know, I want to make sure that 
we're connecting with all of that, not just focusing what's happening here. But you know, for me, it's really important to understand all of the struggles that our community went through, the the challenges and the triumphs, because all that is really what you know for me fuels me to do better and understand and also expose that to to not just the youth but also their parents. So you know, we make a conscious decision of like going to Delano and having folks learn and meet generation of, uh, of uh, Filipino farmers, you know, their families that were farmers that fought um, um, the grape strike, right? So all those things is really important um, to make sure and to really strengthen Soma Filipinas. Yeah. Well, I mean, oh my God, we can be talking forever. Um, and I just, on behalf of Glide, just want to thank all three of you, uh, not only for being here, because that that's a treat, but the honor of all you, that you've done and and how you have kept things moving. And it's, you know, it's no accident. The women are the ones that always rule, which is a beautiful thing, right? It's a beautiful thing. And so, um, you know, I just, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. And um, we have now been doing this for almost two years and have a cohort of panelists and community members who've gone back to watch this and have signed up. Um, so what we hope to do with that is that, so when you all are, are, are looking at something and you need support that we rally behind you um, so that you are not alone, that you, you have us, we got your back. And, and, and just please know that, um, you know, want to just thank everyone who will be watching this. Thank you all who are here. Uh, there is a beautiful, beautiful culture and community that is alive and well. And we encourage all of you to learn about Somos Filipinos Heritage District and history throughout the Bay Area, because there's a rich history that's there that needs to be told and but also needs to be learned from. And, uh, and we lift up our elders who provide us with that love and guidance. Um, our next virtual justice series will be Native American Heritage Month, and that's going to be on Thursday, November 18th, same time, same channel. But we encourage everyone to come onto our website, glide.org backslash Center for Social Justice, and learn more about the organizations that these incredible women leaders are a part of, because we're going to be posting their websites on our website. And we encourage you to go in and to learn and to participate and to be an advocate and an ally to our community members and brothers and sisters here. So I can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mil gracias for being here and for being who you are and all that you do. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Take care. Thank be well. You.